Up next, Dr. Al Waldo and Dr. Andre Legersh, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Melbourne in Australia, discuss sport and the heart. I'm Al Waldo, and I'm here with Dr. Andre Legersh. Welcome, Andre. Thank you very much. So this is the most interesting topic, and I know you've done some work particularly on ventricular arrhythmias. Can you tell us about it and its implications? Sure. I mean, on the background of exercise, which, as we all know, has overwhelming health benefits, there's emerging interest in the fact that there's a small number of athletes doing extreme amounts of exercise in whom there may be an increased risk of atrial arrhythmias and possibly also of ventricular arrhythmias. And so I'm working at the moment in Belgium with Professor Hein Heidbuchel, who first described a cohort of athletes who had ventricular arrhythmias and when further characterised and intensively characterised had abnormalities of right ventricular structural, functional and electrical issues very much confined to the right ventricle and not the left ventricle. So our research at the moment is aimed at looking at the mechanisms, causes and the consequences of the right ventricle in athletes. And tell us what you found so far. Well, we've looked at the right ventricle in the context of acute intense exercise and we've demonstrated that the pressures and wall stress on the right ventricle are far greater than those of the or at least the increases with exercise are greater than for the left ventricle, mainly because of the sort of exercise intensity related increases in pulmonary pressures. And therefore, in simple terms, the stress and work of the right ventricle is disproportionately affected during exercise. And then after long bouts of intense exercise, like after an ultra endurance triathlon, we see profound cardiac fatigue which is almost entirely of the right ventricle and so in essence we think that we're drawing a dotted line between the physiological effects of exercise on the heart which are rendered disproportionately on the right ventricle then during truly extreme bouts of exercise we see fatigue which is again disproportionately rendered on the right ventricle and then chronically And again, I'd emphasise in a small number but potentially important number of athletes, we see ventricular tachycardia which seem to affect the right ventricle very disproportionately. And now we're extending that research into a very involved study where we're using exercise MRI to have a good look at both ventricles during exercise and to combine that with invasive measurements. And As far as we're aware, that's an ambitious and probably the most comprehensive assessment of biventricular function during exercise. You used the term fatigue. Could you define that or explain that a little bit? Yes. In the field of post-exercise changes, there's some debate about the terminology fatigue versus perhaps cardiac injury. What we certainly see is increases in troponin and natriuretic peptides such as BNP and combined with functional abnormalities such as on echocardiography. And so in our most recent study, which hopefully shortly be published, we found a correlation between the change in right ventricular function and the increases in cardiac troponin and BMP. So in fact, they could be argued to be a marker of both either fatigue or in fact injury. I think the term injury is problematic because people then assume that that is permanent, whereas I think clearly with the exercise model that there's a degree of injury that occurs which is completely recovered, that is completely physiological, much as in exercise we would see in skeletal muscle when people exercise. The process is damage, repair or even supercompensation. And I actually believe the same process occurs in the heart. And now we have the specificity and sensitivity of the tools to detect that process. So this is a form of remodeling. So if the athlete continues to do this extreme exercise, the remodeling does not reverse remodel? Well, exactly. I think that what the work or some of the interest lies in 
is if you follow the hypothesis I just outlined, is that if there is damage and recovery, that's all very well, provided there's sufficient time given for recovery. What might happen, like in skeletal muscle, is that if you compound exercise at extreme doses at short enough intervals, then the process of damage and recovery is reversed so that you get a vicious circle of damage. And I think that that's a potential hypothesis that we're working on, which seems to have some rationale. The point is you never get back to where you started, and ultimately then it does do permanent damage. Exactly. However, I think that's a minority of extreme athletes, whereas what we normally see in athletes is people training sensibly with sensible markers, and therefore they have the opposite response where their heart gets stronger and more functional and very minimal chance of long-term damage. Now, when we think of the athlete's heart, we also think of atrial arrhythmias, and you mentioned that. Could you tell us a little about that? I think the atrial arrhythmia is perhaps slightly less controversial than the topic I was just talking about in that there's emerging evidence which is reasonably compelling that there's an increased risk of atrial arrhythmias in those practicing the highest amounts of exercise. And perhaps some of the myocardial substrates are shared But it's a very interesting and important issue because, as I said, the ventricular arrhythmias, I think, affect a very small minority of major health consequence, but a small minority. Whereas atrial fibrillation has been reported to occur in as many as 10% of middle and older aged athletes. There's a lot of work to be done to clarify those numbers, but it could be that it's you know, not insignificant part of the athletic community. Well, one of the things that interested me from what you're talking about, I know that the vagal influence on the atria is to shorten refractory period to make the atria vulnerable to atrial fibrillation. And we know that the atrial fibrillation in the vaguely mediated heart presents often with ventricular rates that are remarkably below 100 because of its effects of the vagus of the AV node. But there's something else you talked about, and that's the pulmonary pressures. I don't think you used the word pressure, but elevation of pulmonary pressure. Can I use that term? That might also cause elevation. If it's affecting the right ventricle, why wouldn't it also be reflected in the right atrium and stretch and that sort of thing? Are those sort of things potentially possible also? I think absolutely. I think I think that there's a lot of work to be done which should be accelerated by these clinical findings that there's an increase in atrial fibrillation. Louis Mont from Barcelona in Spain has done a lot of work on the vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation and it could well be that that's a major component of the increased prevalence in athletes. But I think that there's also the possibility that other substrate elements such as remodeling or adverse remodeling with exercise could be factors. In terms of the pulmonary pressures and the right atrial effects, we've recently demonstrated with our group in Belgium that there's an increased prevalence of atrial flutter as well as atrial fibrillation amongst athletes, which would point more specifically to the right atrium. And also from Louis Mont in Spain, in some animal work, they identified in intensively exercised rats that the effects were rendered on the right ventricle and then also on both atria. So interestingly pointing to the chambers that we are then clinically seeing the arrhythmias in. So I recognize you're still actively involved in the research, but to the extent that we can extrapolate to the clinical implications, would you offer some for us? I think there's some important clinical implications even already in the work. One would be that in athletes who develop atrial fibrillation, ventricular ectopy, I think that we now have enough evidence to suggest that an important part of therapy is to cut back on the exercise. It's not always easy to bring about with the athletes, but given that we're reasonably convinced it's an important part of the substrate, then it needs to be part of the intervention. There's a lot more work to be done in terms of the research and the outcomes from that, but I think there's a loud enough signal. And I think that it also points to the need for further understanding, that it's obviously coming from someone doing research in the area and self-fulfilling, but given that exercise is such an essential part of human life and so many benefits, it seems unusual and perhaps disappointing that we've really underappreciated the higher end spectrum of exercise. 
And that's reinforced also by the fact that there's an epidemic both in people doing not enough exercise, but also now in people doing very high doses of exercise. We need to focus on that and establish just the things that are good and bad so that, for example, we can alter training recommendations to make exercise safe for everyone. I was thinking that the Greeks were probably right, all things in moderation. All things in moderation, or my hope, being a being someone who's quite passionate about endurance sport as well, is that it might be that it's not endurance sport that is the problem, and if we train properly for it, all of these things can be resolved. But you're absolutely right, all things in moderation. Very good, but most informative and interesting in a developing area. We look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you very much.